God is good. Yes, he is. Be turning in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Well, we've covered the eight main types of Bible covenants, the covenants that God himself cut or entered into with man. And last week we covered the shoe covenant. And tonight I want us to learn about another one of the least known types of Bible covenants. Most of you have probably never heard of this covenant. It's called the Threshold Covenant. The Threshold Covenant. There are several references to this covenant in the scriptures, but if you're not familiar with the Eastern customs of Bible days, then you'll read right over these passages and you won't grasp it and you won't understand them. The word Threshold Singular is mentioned 14 times in the King James Version, and the word thresholds, plural, is only mentioned three times in the King James. So that makes a total of 17 times in the King James translation that the word threshold or threshold plural is found. Now, I've got a couple of them listed here in your handout, beginning with 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 4. The King James says there are keepers of the door. Keepers. That word door, keepers of the door. That word door in Hebrew is, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, it's number 5592, and it's cough. In Hebrew, that's the Hebrew word for door, C-A-P-H. And it's referring to the threshold. So the King James translators could have chosen the word threshold instead of the word door. They just chose the word door, but it, the same Hebrew word for threshold is translated here in this verse as door. Another one is Jeremiah 34. 35 verse 4 so you can jot that scripture down and look it up later we won't have time to look them all up jeremiah chapter 35 verse 4 second kings chapter 12 verse 9 this passage in second kings refers to the priest of the threshold or the priest of the door the the threshold covenant is a blood covenant it is a blood covenant. The threshold covenant is one of the most important. It's one of the most powerful customs and practices of the people in Bible times. And if we understood the importance of the threshold covenant, we would be able to better understand so many scriptures in the new covenant, the New Testament. For example, look at your handout. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, he said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where thieves do not break through nor steal. And I read in, in my studies that the word break through could be translated dig through. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where thieves do not dig through or steal. Now, why would a thief have to dig through something? in order to break in your door at, the, at your home. Well, in Bible days, this breakthrough and steal, the thief in Bible days would not come in the front door of a home ever, ever. They would have to dig through, if it was a house, they would dig through the sun-dried bricks of the home, either on the back side of the home or the side, but never the front, never. Never would a thief come in a front door of a home. And if it was out in the, the open where the Bedouin live in tents, a thief would never enter in through the, the tent door, ever. They might cut the tent in the back and break in that way, but they would never come in through the front tent door. Why? Because of the meaning of the threshold. First, what is a threshold? 
The threshold is the bottom piece of wood. Sometimes it was stone, but usually it was wood. It was a seal, a door seal, or a doorway. It was the place of entering into a building. Because the threshold was part of the house foundation, it was sometimes spoken of symbolically to represent the house as a whole. The threshold was used to refer to the house, the whole house. The Nelson's Bible Dictionary says that the threshold or entranceway into the home was man's earliest and most primitive altar to their God, whether they worshipped a false god, an idol god, or whether they worshipped Jehovah, the one and true God. One of the most hilarious scriptures in the Bible concerning the threshold is found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 5. I love this passage, 1 Samuel chapter 5. And if you ever need a good laugh, just open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. This is one of the most hilarious stories in the Word. The Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant. And you know that the Ark of the Covenant was where God's presence dwelt. The Ark of the Covenant. So the enemy, the Philistines, had captured the Ark of the Covenant. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2. When the Philistines took the, took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So these Philistines, the enemy that worshipped their god, Dagon... They had captured the Ark of the Covenant from the children of Israel. They took the Ark of the Covenant into the house of their idol god named Dagon. Now, Dagon was known as the fish god. The Philistines worshipped the fish god, and they called the name of their god Dagon. So the Philistines took the Ark of God, where God's presence dwelt, and they put it into the temple of their idol fish god called Dagon. Now watch what happens. Verse 3. And when they of Ashdod rose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Here is this false idol, this fish god, that's bowing down before the Ark of the Covenant. As a false god, this dumb idol, shaped like a fish, is bowing and falling down before the presence of God, before the Ark of the Covenant. I love this verse. Verse 4. And when they rose early... On the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So the first night, when they, after they put the ark of the covenant in with Dagon, the fish god, the Dagon was just bowing down. So they set Dagon back up. Then the next night, this is what happened. So they got up the next morning, and not only was Dagon bowed down to the God, the Jehovah God, but both of the palms of his hands were cut off. The head of this fish God was cut off. And where were they lying? On the threshold, verse 5, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. Oh, I love this story in this chapter. I wish we had time to cover it because it gets funnier as it goes on. The Philistines thought that they had really done something. They thought if they captured the Ark of the Covenant that they would have the children of Israel's God, and that the children of Israel would have no power over them and they would defeat them. But the one and only true Jehovah God showed them who had all power. So this false God fell over, head broke off, 
hands broke off, laying on the threshold. And then the, they began to think, we are in a heap of trouble. And so then God allowed them to be smitten with hemorrhoids, the King James says. You know what that is? Hemorrhoids, that's right. That's right. Oh, they just thought they had trouble. Then they were smitten with, yes. And you can read in the verses and find out where they were smitten with tumors. So as it goes on, they are thinking, whoa, we got to get rid of this thing. We got to get rid of this thing. And they couldn't wait to get rid of the presence of God. Why? Because God is God, not Dagon, not any other false God. God is God. Now, where was the hands laying of this false God? Where? Where was the head and the hands? Upon the threshold. They weren't thrown out in the, in the yard. They were laying specifically for a special purpose on the threshold. And notice, verse 5 says, Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. Dagon's followers did not want to cross the area of the threshold because Jehovah God had demonstrated without a doubt that he is the one that possessed all power. And he possessed the power over that threshold, the entrance way into the house of their God. Now in the Bible days, the threshold was the family altar where sacrifices were made to the family deity or God, whatever God that that nation worshipped, they worshipped their God at the threshold of their home, at the entranceway of their home. The purpose of the threshold was for requesting protection from the family God and to invite that God into their home. Now, the prophet Elijah had some strong words for God's people who wanted to worship God and worship false gods, too. They wanted to straddle the fence. They wanted to have them both. They wanted to worship Jehovah God, but they also wanted to worship false gods. And the prophet Elijah said in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, you can read in your handout. And Elijah came and all the people and said... How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The American Standard Version says of this verse, And Elijah came near unto all the people and said, How long go ye limping between the two sides? My Jewish encyclopedia says... That this could have been rendered, how long will you leap over both thresholds? How long will you leap over the threshold of God and leap over the threshold of Baal? How long are you going to leap over both thresholds? How long are you going to try to worship both gods? The literal translation of this is, how long hop you about? Going from one to the other, one to the other. The word halt Translated in the King James, how long halt ye between two opinions? If you look that word halt up in the Hebrew, it's P-A-C-A-C-H. And it means to hop or to skip over. The word Pesach in Hebrew is so significant. It means to leap over or to pass over. It's the Hebrew word for Passover, the feast of Passover, comes from this Hebrew word, Pesach. And we'll talk more about that in a, just a few minutes. In the Old Testament Bible days, people worshipped their gods, like I said, at the entrances of their homes. The children of Israel worshipped God in their tent door. Had you ever read the, all those verses in Exodus and wondered about those? Look at, look at one of them. You can either turn to it or read it in your hand out of either one. Exodus chapter 33, verses 8 through 10. Exodus 33, 
8 through 10. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood where? At the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man, where? In his tent door. Ah, every time you read in Exodus where Moses entered to the into the the tabernacle to talk to God. The people are standing in the tent door worshiping God. And after studying the threshold covenant, it will give you such a much better understanding of so many of the scriptures in the Bible. And we can understand even some of our traditions today in our day. Like, why is the bride carried over the threshold? Had you ever thought about that? It comes from the threshold covenant. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that one night when we're doing the blood covenant. This custom of carrying the bride over the threshold is believed to have come from the threshold covenant. The, the bride and the groom are entering into a blood covenant when they cross the threshold in Bible days in the East, when guests arrived at a home, had a blood welcome at the door. Let me explain a little bit about it so if you've never studied it, it's, it's fascinating. If you was a guest in the East, if you went to, if you was traveling and you, it, it was getting close to sundown and you saw a tent in the distance, you would head for that tent. But when you arrived at that tent, you would not dare go inside unless you was invited. The guest would wait outside of the home while the homeowner selected a lamb or, a, or some other animal. And the homeowner would bind the feet of this animal and lay the animal on the threshold of the door. The homeowner would hold that animal with his left hand, and with his right hand, he would slit that animal's throat, whether it be a lamb or any other small animal, and the blood would drain out into a trench that was dug at the threshold. And after the blood from this lamb or other animal, after it drained into the trench, then and only then would the guest cross over the threshold and enter into the home. By crossing over this blood threshold doorway, the guest understood that he had a type of agreement that he was entering into with this family. Never saw him before, probably would never see him again. But if he covenant crossed that threshold of blood, he was entering into an agreement. He was creating a covenant by that act. The homeowner was extending a covenant opportunity to this guest. And by stepping over the blood-stained threshold, the guest was entering into a covenant with the host, the homeowner. The guest always stepped over the threshold, never on it, never would you step on the threshold. For centuries, covenants in the East have been ratified by blood. In the Eastern mind, blood represents life. God said in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So the blood poured out on the threshold represented the life of the host, the homeowner. And the greatest insult 
that a guest could convey was to be was for him to step on the threshold, to step on that bloody threshold. The verse in the New Testament takes on a whole new meaning when you understand that. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. I used to read this and I would think, what in the world could this possibly mean? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. The writer of Hebrews says, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite to the Spirit of grace. The blood-soaked wooden cross is our threshold to God. Jesus' death on the cross is our door, our entrance way to salvation and everything else that Jesus provided for us. Anyone who refuses the bloody threshold of the wooden cross has trodden underfoot, has trampled on the Lord Jesus Christ and counted his blood of the covenant that he cut in his own blood, counted it as an unholy thing. Man, can you see it? It's referring to the threshold covenant, trodden under it, the Son of God. Now we can better understand this verse, which before we've just read over and never comprehended the seriousness of it. In the East, the costliness of the blood was an indication of the degree of honor to be conveyed on the guest. If the guest was not considered very important, if it was just a common traveler, then the blood of a dove or a pigeon might be offered. Somebody unimportant, somebody ordinary. But if the guest was considered to be more important, the blood of a lamb or other animal would be offered. But if the guest were royalty... If the guest was a king, then the blood of a very special animal called the fatted calf was killed. The fatted calf was reserved only for the king or someone of royalty. Only then would the blood of the fatted calf be poured out. This helps us to see the story of the prodigal son in a whole new light. When he came to the father, that prodigal son had squandered his inheritance and he came back home, and when the prodigal son came back home, the father said in Luke chapter 15, verses 22 through 23, But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. The father treated that prodigal son like a king. Like royalty. There he was coming from a stinky, smelly pig pen, been eating the, the food that the pigs eat, traveling for days. But the father said, oh, that's my son. Kill the fatted calf. That's what God does for us. In Bible days, another important fact about a guest was that when he crossed the threshold of the host's home, he was agreeing to come in peace. And he was agreeing to honor and bless that home while he was in it. No honorable man would cross the threshold of a host home intending to rob him or kill him or to do him any kind of harm. And by the host, the homeowner, allowing the guest to cross over his threshold and receive him into his home, the host was promising to protect this guest as long as that guest was in his home. Once you understand this, this makes the scripture of Lot protecting the two angels. It makes, it makes it make a little bit more sense to our Western minds. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. 
Genesis chapter 19, since we don't live in the East and don't understand the customs of the East, we read over a lot of these passages and they're just, they're just unthinkable to us about how this could be done. Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, two angels came to Sodom, and Lot insisted that these angels, these men, as they appeared to be, Lot insisted that they stay in his house. Verses 4 and 5 of Genesis 19, the wicked men of Sodom surrounded Lot's home and insisted that Lot turn these two men over to them in order for them to commit ungodly sexual acts with them. Verse 6. Look at verse 6. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. Notice the word door is mentioned twice. Two times. A different Hebrew word is used for each, each one. The first word door and Lot went out at the door is the Hebrew word P-E-T-C-H-A-A-H. And it denotes the entrance or doorway. The second word door, and Lot went out the, at the door unto them and shut the door. This word door, the second word door, in the Hebrew is delet, D-E-L-E-T. And it means the door, the actual door, which is capable of being opened and shut. So Lot went out at the first door. He went out at the entrance or doorway, and then he closed the literal wooden door behind him. Lot stepped over the threshold of blood, and he closed the door, and he was saying, in essence, these two men are behind the blood, and I will not let you have them. Amen. Now, Lot's response to the men of the city of Sodom, it just boggles our minds. I'm sure you've read this story. Verse 8. Lot said, Behold now, I have two daughters, which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and, ye, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. This is unthinkable to us. Would you, if a stranger that you had never seen before, came to your house to spend the night, and you knew that you would never see them again, and somebody came knocking at your door demanding that you bring those, that stranger out, and you turn and say, well, here, I have two daughters, my own flesh and blood. You can take them and do whatever you want to them, but you can't have this stranger that I've never laid eyes on before and I will never see again. You can't have him, but you can have my own flesh and blood. Our Western minds can't comprehend that. Our Western minds goes tilt, tilt, tilt. Our brain that just boggles and overloads our brain. How could Lot do that? It's an unthinkable thing. Because Lot had made a threshold covenant with these two men. These two men entered his house. They crossed the threshold of blood. And Lot was bound by the blood covenant to protect these men at any cost. As long as they was in his home. He was bound by the blood of the threshold covenant to protect these two men more than he was willing to protect his two virgin daughters. A quote from the Adam Clark commentary says, A man who had taken a stranger under his care and protection was bound to defend him, even at the expense of his own life. Now, how do we know that Lot had entered into a threshold covenant with these two men? Notice the phrase where Lot said, these men came under the shadow of my roof. Now, I read that this is a Hebrew idiom, idiom, I-D-I-O-M, idiom denoting the covenant commitment of a host to protect the one who has covenant crossed the threshold. 
He has coveted with him. He has promised to protect him with all of his available resources, even give his own life if necessary to protect this stranger that has crossed over the threshold of blood and come into his house. This opens up a whole new understanding to Psalms 91, verses 1 through 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Think about it. To an even greater degree than Lot was willing to protect the men that had passed over his threshold. Lot was saying, I will protect them with all of my available resources, even give up my daughter's lives. I'll even give up my own life. But God is saying, even to a greater degree than man would be willing to do that, God says, I'm willing to protect those who have covenant crossed my threshold, where the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus was poured out. God uses all of his available resources to protect us when we covenant cross the threshold of the wooden cross of Calvary. In Bible days, the doorway or threshold was considered a sacred area. It was the place where agreements were made. It was the place where God himself often made agreements with his people, the children of Israel. And because we have had no understanding of the threshold covenant, we've missed the best example of the threshold covenant in the Bible. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. When God was getting ready to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, God instructed them to kill a lamb. And to drain the lamb's blood. Exodus chapter 12 verse 22. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. And strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. We read this and we don't have an understanding fully of what it's saying. Notice the word basin. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. This word basin is the Hebrew word kof. Kof. And it means a dish for holding blood or wine. It's translated in the King James as threshold in many places. It's translated as basin. In some places, it's translated as door, it's translated as gate and post, this Hebrew word cough, but it could be translated in all those places as threshold. God instructed the children of Israel that they were to dip the hyssop into the blood of that lamb that was in that trench at the threshold and to put the blood of that lamb on the two side posts and over the door. And this formed the shape of a Hebrew letter T, which is the Hebrew letter for the cross. Not like this, not like our cross, but like this. So now, before we read verse verse 23, let me explain another custom in Bible days. In ancient times, it was a common practice for a king to travel throughout his land his dominion, in order to secure the loyalty of the people and to rid the land of all the people who who were not loyal to him. All of the king's enemies were to be destroyed. So the king traveled with his representatives and with his army. And in each village that the king came to, Either he personally or one of his representatives, one of his soldiers, would pass over. They would covenant cross the threshold of the families of each family that was loyal to the king. And they would enter into the home in peace and declare the the terms of the kingdom. And when the king found a home that was not loyal to him, he would not covenant cross the threshold. He would not pass over the threshold. He would send his soldiers in 
to kill every member in that home in order to rid the land of the king's enemies. And he could tell immediately which house was going to be loyal to him and which house was not loyal. He could tell by the blood poured out at the threshold of the house whether that house was loyal to him and was inviting him in. And now that we understand the Eastern Threshold Covenant and the Eastern Greeting pertaining to the visit of a king, we can understand this next verse, 23. Verse 23 of Exodus 12. For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. This word, the words pass through, for the Lord will pass through. The, that phrase is the, in the Hebrew is abar, A-B-A-R, and it means to cross over. And then it, toward the, the middle part of the verse and toward the end of the verse, for the Lord will pass over the door. That word pass over in the Hebrew is Pesach, P-A-C-A-C-H, and it literally means to leap over, like we talked about a few minutes ago. ago. Clay Trumbull says that the Passover means a leaping over of the threshold after it's been sanctified by the blood of the threshold covenant. God was saying to the children of Israel, when I see the blood on your home, I will Pesach, I will pass over, I will covenant cross that door, I will leap over the blood, I will leap over the blood at that threshold and I will come into that house wherever I see the blood and I will not allow the enemy or the destroyer to come into that house and destroy you. And once we understand this eastern concept of the threshold covenant and the Jewish Passover, we can understand the new covenant made by the blood of Jesus the Messiah. In the new covenant, God reverses the role of the Hebrew Passover. God says to us, I want, I want to treat you as a king. I wish to treat you as royalty. I wish to treat you as the royal one. And invite you to come into my house. And invite you to step over, to pass over, to leap over the threshold where the most important blood in the universe was poured out. Not the blood of bulls and goats or lambs, but the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. God is saying that this is my own blood poured out through the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Our threshold is the bloody wooden cross. And what Jesus did on that piece of wood is our doorway to God. Colossians 1.20 says there is peace through the blood of his cross. And when you Pesach, when you pass over, when you step over, when you leap over the wooden threshold of the cross, you enter into a blood covenant with him. You enter into the threshold blood covenant. And if you want to be under the shadow of his roof, like those two men that came to Lot, Lot said, you can't have them. You can't have them, men. They're under under the shadow of my roof. They've come under my threshold. They're under my protection. And there's no way you can have them. And when we covenant cross the threshold of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we come to that bloody threshold, God says, enemy, devil, you can't cross the bloodline. You can't covenant cross that threshold. You can't come into their house. You can't destroy them. Destroyer, you got to keep on going down the road. You find you another house that don't have the blood of the lamb applied to it. You go in that house, but not this house, not my house, not your house, because our house is covered with the blood, the, the bloody wooden cross of Calvary. We have gone to that cross, and we've entered into a 
blood covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We've come under his shadow. We're under his protection. And the destroyer has to pass on by. He can't come in. He can't keep us. Well, glory. Glory to God. The threshold of the wooden cross is the doorway to God and the doorway to all of his benefits, salvation, eternal life, healing, protection, and every other benefit listed in the new covenant. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament. It should have been translated the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Hallelujah. And when you Pesach, when you pass over, when you leap over the wooden threshold of the cross and enter into that threshold blood covenant, you're also, listen, you're also entering into a marriage covenant with Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is our beloved bridegroom. And just as the bridegroom carries that bride over that threshold, that bloody threshold, hallelujah, to this day in the east, some of the Bedouin, the tent dwellers in the east, they still pour out a blood libation as a, the completion of the marriage covenant. When the marriage day arrives, the bridegroom comes with a lamb in his arms. He comes to the tent door of the father of the bride. And then before witnesses, the bridegroom, he cuts that lamb's throat. And as soon as the blood of that lamb falls out upon that, that threshold, that trench dug at the threshold, the marriage ceremony is regarded as complete. To this day, in the Bedouin land of the east, the, among the tent dwellers, in Bible lands, listen, in, in the Bedouin of, of Sinai, the custom is that the bride is sprinkled with the blood of the lamb before she surrendered to the bridegroom. Not only does that bridegroom bring the lamb to the threshold of his, of his bride-to-be father's door, kills the lamb, drains the blood into the trench at the threshold, but then the bride is sprinkled with some of the blood of that lamb. How does this apply to us? We have Pesach. We have passed over. We have leaped over. We have stepped over the bloody threshold of the wooden cross and entered into the threshold blood covenant with the Lord. And then we've been sprinkled with the lamb's blood in order to be presented to our beloved bridegroom, the lamb of God who died on a bloody wooden cross. Hallelujah. And our wedding garment has been washed in the lamb's blood. Hallelujah. So that we may be presented to our beloved bridegroom. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 7, 14. These are they which have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And we say, hallelujah.
come, Lord Jesus. First Thessalonians 4, 17. So shall we ever be with the Lord when Jesus, our beloved bridegroom, comes for us. Hallelujah. And our garments are going to be washed in the Lamb's blood shed on the threshold covenant of the bloody wooden cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. And we will be united with Jesus, our beloved bridegroom. Hallelujah. So shall we ever be with the Lord and sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. And be wed to our beloved bridegroom and become Mrs. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Give him praise for he is worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain for us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. 